Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final presentation of our Fall 2021 Lunch and Lawn series. We've been here from 12.15 to 1 p.m. every other Wednesday since August 25th. So if you missed any of our earlier programs, you can find them on our VCE Fairfax YouTube channel. We'll give you a link to that site a little later. This program is sponsored by, Fair, by the Fairfax County Master Gardener Association, which operates under the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. Our trained Master Gardener volunteers share with you science-based information about gardening and horticulture topics. In each lunch and lawn session, we review a few key lawn topics and answer your questions about lawns, weeds, and sometimes the challenges from insects or lawn diseases. This program is being recorded, so please keep your microphones muted. If you do have questions that you did not submit when you registered, please enter them into the chat box and we will try to answer them toward the end of our program. Also, we will have links in the chat box related to the topic being presented. Go ahead and take a look at them during the presentation. We do need to conclude by 1 p.m. So if your question isn't answered, we will respond to you through email. My name is Elizabeth and I am the moderator for today's session. And the Master Gardener panel, panel members joining me are Kathy, Roseanne, and Nancy. And our Zoom host is Jenny. Our program is divided into three parts. First is our main lawn care topic, benefits of a healthy lawn, followed by details of Johnson grass, a weed that you may encounter in your yard soon, if not now, and how to identify and treat the three most common grubs in our area. Finally, we will answer your lawn questions, taking those that we received during registration first, and then any we have in today's chat box. So panel members, are you ready to begin? Our first presentation by Kathy is on the benefits of a healthy lawn, and it should be very interesting. We normally only think of the aesthetic aspects of lawns since so many of us put in hours and hours to their care. Today, we see that they offer us much more. In our first session this fall, we learned about managing our lawns as an ecosystem, which gave us a lot to think about in terms of the use of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. While these may all be needed at one point or another in caring for our lawns, it is understanding when and how we use these pro products that gets us to our healthiest and therefore most attractive lawns. Today, we see how these healthy lawns help us. Kathy. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm Kathy Kerthois, and let's talk about benefits of a healthy lawn. Our lawns are places of beauty that enhance our homes. And when we think of them, we think of the enjoyment they give us and our families and mm -hmm. our neighbors. Lawns are also spaces that demand our attention and need best management skills. By keeping our lawns healthy, we reap the benefits for ourselves, our neighborhoods and our environment. We also save time, effort and money in the long run. So here we'll talk about some benefits of the healthy lawn and then look at some best practices for maintaining it. So a healthy lawn is a dense growth of grass and grass that's appropriate for our area. Here in Fairfax County, we have mostly cool season grasses. A healthy lawn is grown from soil that holds moisture and nutrients and promotes biological activity. It is managed with an eye on the calendar. Planning and care take place year round, following good practices of fertilizing, watering, mowing, aerating, and top dressing, and also controlling weeds and disease. For example, this is a good time for core aeration, top dressing, overseeding, and fertilizing to prepare grass for spring growth. These are standards of practice, but not mandatory every year. You determine if your grass needs some or all of these actions. 
A healthy lawn begins with a soil test to find out what nutrients are needed in what quantity to support growth. It tells you if the soil pH is too low or too high, if an application of lime is needed, and how much to use. You can find more information on soil testing in our second Lunch and Lawn presentation for fall 2020, Testing Soil, and you can see the link here in our chat box. So that grass you have, is it good or bad? Uh, lawns have been researched and debated in recent years to look at the question, is maintaining a lawn good for the environment or harmful? Here in this graphic, you can see benefits of having a lawn, but there are concerns too, such as lawns take a lot of watering, they must be fertilized, they compete with plants for nutrients and a place to grow. Herbicides are often used to control weeds. Lawn care equipment sends fumes into the air. We are within the Chesapeake Bay watershed and we want to be environmentally conscious in our gardening. Here on Lunch and Lawn, for example, we also looked at this in this September 6th presentation, Benefits of a Healthy Ecosystem, which was mentioned a few moments ago. And you can find that link in our chat box too. We all think our own landscape will have little impact on the environment, but the effect is cumulative. We're going to have lawns so we can all do our part for our environment while maintaining our space. Many of these concerns can be addressed by planning ahead and using best practices in lawn care. Now let's look at how healthy lawns benefit our surroundings, our neighborhood, and our region. So one thing we all love about our lawns is that they are a soft, resilient place for pets and kids to play. The lawn is a big attraction for family recreation, sports, or relaxing. A maintained green lawn has great curve appeal and creates a setting for other plants in the home landscape. It can also add to property value when it comes time to sell a home. An added bonus, lawns and landscape plants can cut noise levels by absorbing and deflecting sounds, keeping your space quieter. Air quality is a big consideration. Lawns and landscape plants trapped dust and other airborne particles, helping improve air quality in that respect. By helping prevent weeds growing, turf grass can reduce airborne pollen. Turf grass removes carbon dioxide from the air during photosynthesis, and then it releases oxygen. Over a year, a lawn that measures 2,500 square feet absorbs enough carbon dioxide to produce oxygen for a family of four according to university research. And that brings us to carbon sequestration. What does that mean? Basically, it's when plants capture carbon dioxide from the air and use energy from the sun to turn the carbon into sugars that fuel plant growth and development. Research shows that for a suburban home on a half acre lot with a grass lawn and landscape plants, it's the grass that captures between 80% and 90% of the total carbon captured in the landscape. In towns and cities in America, there's an estimated 40 to 50 million acres of grassland. The managed grasses absorb more carbon than is released into the air, taking into account exhaust from power tools used for lawn maintenance. So grass is responsible for a net reduction of carbon in the atmosphere, according to research. Reducing water runoff is another benefit. A lawn's system of roots, thatch, and leaves creates resistance to water flow and slows it down, reducing its force. That allows more of the water to sink into the soil. This also reduces the soil particles and sediment that wash away. The grass acts as a filter so fewer pollutants enter local groundwater compared to when water runs off hard surfaces like pavement and sidewalks. A 2,500 square foot lawn of natural grass on sandy loam soil can capture about a thousand gallons of rainwater before runoff takes place. So unless there is a deluge, 
best practices will promote rain capture. Since our area is part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, as you can see here on this map, we look to practice environmentally responsible lawn care as much as possible to protect our waterways. Reducing stormwater runoff from pavement and other impervious surfaces is a growing concept in landscape design. For example, rain gardens are added in some residential neighborhoods to help direct water through the landscape. Turf areas can be designed as catchment and filtration zones to protect the groundwater. A healthy lawn can absorb rainfall four times better than a hay field. And a related benefit is erosion control. Turf grass also reduces erosion caused by wind and water by holding soil in place. A well-maintained home landscape can reduce erosion and increase water retention and soil fertility. Turf grasses are some of the most effective ground covers, not only to prevent erosion and saturated soil, but also to remedy severely compacted soil and protect areas with steep slopes. At con construction sites, sod is laid next to curbs to prevent soil erosion and act as a buffer strip. A healthy lawn can lessen the risk of flooding and protect frozen ground over the winter. And speaking of soil, when our lawns are healthy, the soil should be too, and that's good for more than growing plants. A lawn's fibrous root system and ground cover help generate topsoil and create habitats for a variety of living organisms. You're promoting microbial diversity. Dozens of beneficial organisms can thrive within the root systems of healthy grasses. As this graphic shows, there is a food web of primary, secondary, and other creatures in our soil. As the grass roots grow and die and decompose, this annual growth cycle builds hummus, which keeps soil biologically active and improves physical and chemical properties of the soil over time. The most fertile soils in the world were created under grassland. Another bonus, a lawn is a natural air conditioner, in a sense, because water that evaporates through the grass creates the effect of cooling the air. Around a home with a lawn, temperatures can be several degrees lower than around hard surfaces. Some research shows 7 to 14 degrees cooler. And turf grass can even lower summer air conditioning costs. During the summer, lawns are about 30% cooler than paved surfaces and also much cooler than bare ground, research has shown. Lawns provide cooler places for outdoor sports and recreation than asphalt and concrete surfaces will provide. Another note, fire breaks. In fire prone areas, having a maintained lawn rather than trees within about 30 to 50 feet of a residence can help reduce risk of fire damage. Now let's talk about benefits of good lawn maintenance. If we want all of these benefits from our lawns, they should be well maintained. And these practices can improve the impact on the environment, save you time and work and money. Planning ahead means you'll be taking action to prevent problems rather than reacting to them when they crop up. Maintaining a healthy lawn includes fertilizing, watering, mowing, aerating, top dressing, and controlling weeds and disease. And here's a look at some best practices. Smart mowing. Cutting your grass to the right height is important. Lawns cut too short are an invitation for weeds to grow. For grasses we typically grow in this region, plan to keep them mowed to a height of between three and four inches. Only mow when the grass is dry. Regular mowing increases shoot density and root mass, which improves soil stability. If you have a lot of grass, you might consider switching to an electric or self-powered mower to reduce air and noise pollution. Changing mowers this way can be more practical if lawn size is reduced in favor of other plants or alternatives. 
When we talk about grass cycling, we mean mowing your grass and leaving the clippings in place on the lawn. It's a simple, direct way of adding nutrients and organic matter back into your lawn, saving time and money on fertilizers. In many cases, you'll need only minimal additional fertilizer to keep your lawn healthy. You will save time and effort that would have been spent filling plastic or paper bags to dispose of grass clippings, and that saves space in the landfill. Yard waste in landfills is a huge source of methane, a greenhouse gas more harmful than carbon dioxide. Methane emissions from landfills in 2019 were about equivalent to the greenhouse gas emissions from about 22 million passenger vehicles driven for one year, according to an EPA study. And you can see the link to that study here in the chat box. And finally, weeding. A dense lawn with grass mown to three or three and a half inches high can crowd out the weeds and shade them, limiting their chance to grow and thrive. Hand weeding is always best when it's possible to do so. And if you use chemicals, do that as a last resort. And of course, always follow label directions very carefully. We mentioned soil tests and fertilizing, and here's a little bit more about that. Soil tests are the most accurate and reliable way to determine your lawn's pH and what nutrients the soil may need. Be sure to take the step to give your lawn the best chance of growing well. pH is the main thing you look for in soil test results, such as the sample shown on this slide. Soil testing takes the guesswork out of how much fertilizer to use. You'll need to know how much to use and when to apply it to get your soil the nutrients it really needs. Applying fertilizer in the wrong amount or the wrong time may make conditions worse and increase insect and disease problems. Excess fertilizer is likely to wash away before the grass can take it up, and the runoff can contribute to unwanted plant growth in nearby waterways. Use a nitrogen fertilizer that's at least 50% slow release. Slow release ensures the lawn has nitrogen through the root growing season. The fast release fertilizers can lead to runoff of excess nitrogen and promote growth where you don't want it and maybe cause more mowing. Watering should be carefully planned and monitored to prevent waste so that you're not watering your sidewalk or your neighbor's sidewalk. Watering slowly and deeply helps grass develop deep roots, so you will need to water less frequently. Soils can absorb only so much water. The recommended amount is one inch per week, whether by rain or your own irrigation. Try placing containers with one inch marks under your sprinkler to gauge how much water your lawn is getting. The time of day matters too. It's advised to water early in the morning, say between 4 or 5 a.m. and 8 or 9 a.m. You may consider having a smaller lawn to keep the lawn benefits but reduce maintenance. And here in this slide is a, a diagram of a rain garden, which I've mentioned as an alternative to uh, turf grass. And some other alternatives include ornamental grasses, trees, shrubs and perennials, vegetable gardens, ground covers, which are especially helpful in shady areas, meadows, and of course, rain gardens. On the next three slides are a number of resources I consulted for this presentation. The University of Missouri's fact sheet here at the top of the list has a wealth of details for gardeners. And here are some articles from our Fairfax County Master Gardeners who share their expertise on lawns and lawn maintenance. And here you'll see our lunch and lawn presentations on YouTube. And here are several that can be very helpful. I'll point out the lawn care calendar, which gives you a month by month look at the most important tasks and maintenance jobs that you might want to undertake. And that brings us to the end.
Elizabeth, you need to unmute. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, you have taught me some big words today, carbon sequestration and evapotranspiration. Um, I'm getting smarter. Next, Roseanne will be talking about Johnson grass. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yes, Johnson grass, also referred to as sorghum halopens. Um, sounds really nice, but it's not very nice. <laughs> It is a perennial grass weed, and this differs from grab, crabgrass, which is an annual. So we can tell the difference by that, because it's always around, coming back and back. Um, grows to about six foot tall, and the leaves can be two feet long, uh, which is quite drastic for any type of grass. It can be identified also by a very distinct midrib, and I've got a picture further on. Um, it has these small little seeds, that form spikelets. And these can produce about 80,000 seeds in a single growing season. So you can imagine the damage that they can do as far as reproduction. The seed head then flowers from May through October and changes from kind of a dark a green to a dark red and then a brown. Um, that's the seed fruit there. So what are some of the, um, hold on a second the characteristics here. Um, well, Johnson grass is extremely invasive. Um, it can adapt to a wide variety of habitats, which contributes to that invasiveness. And it is considered one of the 10 worst weeds in the world. Kind of a scary thing, especially with Halloween coming forward. Um, it spreads either by those seeds we talked about or, or by rhizomes, which are those underground uh, root systems. Uh, these rhizomes have these orange scales on them, so that's one way you can help identify them. And they form really dense colonies, so it out competes with native vegetation. And as far as a food source, it's used by very few wildlife species, so it's really not beneficial in the big, big picture. Um, it, call, it likes to colonize in disturbed areas, such as gardens, lawns, yards, road sites. In fact, I've seen a lot lately in one of the medians in the roads in my area, kind of a scary thing. Um, also, because it can also take um, seed and grow in the uh, crop fields, okay, it's considered an agricultural pest. Um, because it will infest the fields and reduce any crop yields and also take away from the natural foraging of any animals, the cows and the horses and anything else the farm people have. I have a brother-in-law in, down in Culpeper who has a farm and he said that it is a major, major problem for him down there. So here's some pictures of it. <laughs> you see on the left the flowers from the uh, Johnson grass. Um, the second picture is a picture of the stem and the leaves, and you can see that distinctive white midrib. Number three shows the little seedlings, so you can always watch out for those in your yard. And number four demonstrates the rhizomes and some of the stolons that we see that are distinctive of the Johnson graph. So how do we control it? Mechanically is the Best way, dig it up and bag any grass clumps. Don't compost it. Get rid of that stuff. You don't want it around. Broken roots can form new plants. And I've been dealing with this with a plant in my garden, not Johnson grass, but another plant. It took me two years to finally get rid of all of that because look, the tiniest little pieces of broken roots were forming new plants. It was driving me crazy. Uh, as far as a chemical control within the turf, you can treat any dense patches, but you want to do it in the summer with a, a solution of about 5% glyphosate and surfactant. And the surfactant helps to um, get the glyphosate to stick to the uh, leaves of the uh, Johnson grass. If you find it in your ornamentals, you can use either pre-emergence or post-emergence uh, per the uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension Pest Management Guide, and that's, I think, a link in the chat box there. Uh, it shows good effectiveness for these, uh, the listed 
ingredients on the screen. Um, you always, again, want to read the labels before you use them, okay? And wear any appropriate protective clothing for yourself and others. As far as a post-emergent, again, pest management diet is a good resource. Um, Ornamex, Roundup, and Segment have shown good effectiveness on the seedlings. And repeating, read the labels and wear appropriate protective clothing. And watch out for your neighbors, too. You want to be cautious of where you're spraying this stuff. Um, I had a neighbor spraying weeds in his uh, yard one year, and unfortunately, it was a breezy day, and all of his weed killer was blowing right onto my garden and my tomato plants. So I was not a happy camper. So some of the resources I used, you can see the pest management guide there, uh, University of Missouri Extension, and a couple others. It's good thing to know about, even though we don't have a big problem in this area, um, sometimes it's best a little bit of knowledge ahead of time makes it worth it. So back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Roseanne. The idea of 80,000 weed seeds is downright scary. Our final presenter will be Nancy, who will help us in identifying the grub or larval stages of the three most common beetles in our area. Nancy will help us understand how to identify the damage to our turf and what to do to manage these insects. To you, Nancy. Thank you, Elizabeth. Today we're going to take a look at the uh, grub identification primarily of the uh, predominant grubs found in our area. So on this slide you'll see um, that grubs are of the order Coleoptera, in the family Scarabaeidae, and the Latin word is Phyllophagia. And white grubs, which you see in this slide, are the larval or grub stage of several species of beetles. And as we mentioned, predominant in this area, the also known as the May or June beetles and chafers, we see the Japanese beetle, the European chafer, and the June beetle, quite different in size as well. The life cycle is, includes the eggs, which are extremely tiny. They're uh, spherical, white spherical, pearly white eggs, extremely small, as I mentioned, and darkened just before hatching. They're, they are um, found encased in soil aggregates. And the larvae are uh, one to one and three quarter inch long. They're white with a C-shaped body, a brown head, and three pairs of legs. Hind portion of the abdomen is slightly enlarged and appears darker, or, and which it's the um, soil particles through the body wall. That's what one can see. Two parallel rows of spines on the underside of the last abdominal segment distinguish true white grubs from similar looking larvae. We have the pupa, which is the length of this is uh, they vary, but anywhere from three quarters of an inch to one inch long. Pupa is usually white, faint yellow, or dark brown in color. And then we have our adult beetle. The life cycles vary. Some species complete growth in one year, while others require as many as four years. Common life cycles of most destructive and abundant in these beetles extends over three years. Male adults mate in the evening and at dawn females return to the ground to deposit 15 to 20 eggs. And as you can see, they burrow with this uh, diagram. It's almost uh, like a hill appearance. They uh, come out of the ground, they go through their their uh, mating and their hatching and then return to the soil deeper during the colder months. Eggs hatch about three weeks later into the young larvae. They feed on roots and decaying vegetables throughout the summer and in autumn migrate downward and remain inactive until spring. Grub problems can be observed by primarily identifying the type of white grub, which you saw some examples of the grubs in the first slide. The masked chafer grubs have a chestnut colored reddish brown head, 
Japanese beetle grubs have a tan colored yellowish brown head. Determining the correct identification of the white grub species is important in managing strategies and timing of controls. And here is a wonderful chart showing um, not only the white grub larva, but the pupa, and then the adults of the adult of a Japanese beetle, northern mask chafer, and the Asiatic garden beetle. And I missed mentioning the uh, oriental beetle. It's a wonderful slide from Rutgers. Now, a very interesting uh, word about grubs is the raster patterns. And uh, if you have your um, white grub types using your 10 power hand lens, you can, they can be identified by studying the, these patterns. The arrangement of small spines, bristles, or hairs on the underside of the last body segments or the tip of the butt. And there's one wonderful slide from Cornell University showing someone holding this tiny grub, just you know, observing those raster patterns. I'm not so sure that's for us, but we might, we, we, we leave that to the entomologists. True white grubs feed on the fine root hairs of grasses and potentially, potentially field crops. High populations can prune roots and reduce the ability of grass to uptake water and other nutrients. The above ground symptoms of this injury are plant wilting and purpling of the leaves and stems. Fields with large infestations of white grubs will experience stand loss. Now, although this slide shows um, some corn seedlings, it seems to identify best this decline in the root structure when there's white grub damage. And of course it affects, we know that the grub injury affects our turf grasses as well, but we thought this was a good illustration to show. Healthy lawns cut three inches or higher can tolerate a lot of insect feeding without showing injury. Injury doesn't need to be treated every year if the turf is quite healthy, unless there's significant injury. To confirm damage, if the turf appears to be thin or lifts like a carpet, use a shovel and sift through the top three inches of soil, roots and thatch. The C-shaped creamy white grub with tan to rusty brown heads and six legs will be present and count your grubs in this one foot square area. If there are six to 10 grubs, treatment is suggested. However, to encourage growth, replace the grass and water it. Damage can depend on the, scrub, the grub species and the turf quality. And here we have a sampling technique showing two different slides. The first slide on your left, of course, is the, what was mentioned just above about sampling a one square foot area, three inches deep. Now, mechanically, you're actually digging that and lifting the uh, turf. The uh, photograph on the right shows the individual with, who has pulled up that thinning, rather scarce, turf and uh, as you've seen oftentimes this happens this time of year and you count the grubs and as mentioned six to ten per square foot may grubs may require treatment milky spore is one of the biological controls suggested and parasitic nematodes these two types are um, can be are utilized as uh, with different instructions. The milky spore controls only the Japanese beetle, which may take up to 30 days for grubs to die. White grub populations can be suppressed by the parasitic nematode and treatment requires moist conditions. If temperature fluctuations can also limit the survival of the parasitic nematode, which might be more difficult to control. To avoid exposure 
to UV light damage, apply late in the day, and water before and after treatment, avoiding cold temperatures. So below we have three links. Um, one, of course, is on the milky spore application. The other white grub, these are all uh, wonderful links for your, uh, your processing to determine how to treat these grubs that have damaged your turf. Now, chemical controls uh, vary also. But again, keep in mind they're chemical controls, so you need to be uh, protected. So the timing of the application varies with different types of grubs and preventative control can be applied from April to mid-July. Curative controls can be applied from late July through August. You water in measured controls according to the label instructions. And here we have um, from our pest management guide, 2021. Uh, there's a, an instruction that chemical products, as I mentioned before, should be applied at the labeled rate and watered in with half inch of water. Make certain that grubs are present. <laughs> Insect control is most effective against young grubs and always again be certain to wear protective goggles and clothing, gloves, etc. So this chart shows um, chemical treatments. There are possible botanical treatments which means that um, animals and human beings are not affected. So this long list, specifically the milky spore as I mentioned earlier is not effective on most grub species other than uh, Japanese beetles. Some of the resources, um, again, these are uh, Beetle Mania, the last mention on the page. It's a wonderful uh, site um, from our own Virginia Tech. And it's, uh, it's very helpful, particularly for our region, and uh, gives all kinds of instructions for the different types of controls. Thank you, Nancy. And I think many people would be interested to know the best way to combat a Japanese beetle is to catch it before it becomes a beetle. And also thank you for all of the nice drawings and photos because we now know what, we, what we're looking for.